Before we get started with today's show, be sure to check out ESPN Daily. Our podcast is putting out an episode every single day, rain or shine. Some good episodes this week were Pablo Torre interviewing Mina about the Korean Baseball League and Woe's discussing the G League's Professional Pathway Program. Subscribe to ESPN Daily and The Right Time wherever you get your podcast. Also, we're going to be discussing Jordan and the Bulls' first championship with Joe Dumars on The Right Time Book Club here in a little bit. But remember to tune in to The Last Dance. The series continues this Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. You Universally known for his intensity and hunger for basketball dominance, Jordan stuns the basketball world in 1993 when he walks away from the game to play minor league baseball. Then in 95, when his NBA comeback falls short in the playoffs, Jordan uses a perceived slight to fuel his return to greatness. Episodes 7 and 8 of The Last Dance premiere Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. Catch up on every episode on demand and in the ESPN app. If you don't have ESPN, go to ESPNInstantAccess.com to sign up today or listen to the wrap-up podcast hosted by Jalen and Jacoby immediately following the broadcast. Our coverage of The Last Dance is brought to you by State Farm. When you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Coverage is also brought to you by AT&T. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are, in fact, a hater. Uh, coming up on this episode, we got the Right Time Book Club. We're talking to Joe Dumars, two-time champion as a player with the Pistons, one time as an executive. But first... <laughs> last night, you know, at the time of this recording, it was last night, right? Matt Crib, Gabe, I don't know if you experienced this the same way I did. I noticed you kind of, you, you better at unplugging from the machines at night than I am, right? I tend to kind of ride it all out, you know, take in the information. You have a much better work-life balance than I do. And so I look at Earl Thomas is on the Instagram, right? See, this is good because you didn't experience it like the rest of us did because you was, you was chilling, right? So Earl Thomas gets on the Instagram and he says, I just got a call from my agent. Something's about to be on TMZ. It's going to be a video, an incident with me and Nina. Nina's his wife. And I just want to get ahead of this. And I just want to tell y'all that things happen. You know, this is just what it is. You know, it's just sometimes stuff like this comes up. But we need y'all to pray for us, right? Like she and I, we back talking again. But we need y'all to pray for us. And so people hear like TMZ and they hear video and they hear what he's saying and understandably, I saw a lot of people who came to the same conclusion, which was there must be some incidents of domestic violence involved, right? In fact, I'm, I'm not talking out of school bringing this up. I was texting with my man, Joel, Joel Edison. And Joel was like, yo, that video must be really bad, right? He didn't say what he thought was really bad about the video, but I admit my thought was, damn, man. They got a video of Earl Thomas, like, putting his hands on a woman. Like, that would, that would be terrible. And then TMZ came out with the story, right? Like, apparently, after Earl has said that, you know, this has happened, TMZ came with the story. And ladies and gentlemen, it was not the story that we expected. I am going to pull this link up right now so I make sure that I don't miss anything. But apparently what had happened was... Mrs. Earl Thomas and Mr. Earl Thomas got into an argument because of his drinking, right? Apparently she's saying he drank too much. And so he's like, I'm out, right? So he dips. He dips. His brother comes and picks him up. Okay. For whatever reason, Mrs. Earl Thomas then decided, you know what? Where he at? And she used his Snapchat account to figure out where he was at, she saw a video with him with another woman. I don't know who the other woman was that was in this video. I don't know if this other woman is going to come up again in the story. She just found a video with Earl with another woman. At which point, she says, oh, okay. I'm going to figure out where he at. And using that Snapchat account, she tracked his location He was at an Airbnb. And so she about to head to the Airbnb. But before she does, she calls a couple of friends. Earl's brother's woman, right? You know, to meet her over there. She also grabbed Earl's 9mm Beretta. So she got to get 
And she called two friends to meet her over there. I believe I saw one report that said that one of those friends, she who you call when it's time for the ruckus. Because I'm just saying, when it's time to make a call and we about to go bust up in the spot, whatever the spot happens to be, if the plan is we about to bust up in the spot, there's a smaller list of people that you call for that, right? It's not about how big they are. It's not about how tough. It's about how bad it they are. They friends you call and be like, hey, we about to go get Earl. I'll be right there. Don't ask no questions. Don't say nothing else. Just time to ride. We all got a friend like that. I told you, I just one time, man, I thought about doing something like this over a very silly situation. And I called one of my partners was like, yo, I might need you to ride with me. Don't say nothing else. Just come pick me up, right? Like that is who you call, right? I'm assuming that that's who this other person was. So anyway, they get to the Airbnb. This is how TMZ describes it. I want to be very, very clear. And by the way, I also want to make clear that this is Earl Thomas took the clip out the gun before she rolled out, but forgot to see if there was a round in the chamber. And of course there was. And I do not understand these stories about these people who think enough to take the clip out, but don't think enough to check the chamber. Anyway, what do they see when they get to the Airbnb? TMZ says, quote, they discovered Earl and Seth naked in bed with other women. Most people that I've seen on the internet have taken this as a presumption that it was Earl, Seth, and the women in the same bed that might be possible at this Airbnb, how big you think the bed is, right? You can't fit all that in a double. Maybe they were in the same bed, or maybe they were in different beds in the same crib with the same plant. I'm not saying which of those interpretations is right or wrong. I'm just saying that I think that there's a little bit of mystery in there, but the part that is not mysterious is it was two dudes with two women who were not they women, Except they women rolled up and one of them had the Beretta and another one had a knife. Yes, 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 yes. One of them had a knife. So here's from TMZ. One of the women in the house shot cell phone video of the incident that I'm sure we will see soon, maybe even before this podcast is released, which they say shows Nina pointing the gun at Earl's head from less than a foot away and it can clearly be seen that Nina's finger was on the trigger and the safety is disengaged. Now, Nina says she was just trying to scare him, but it says here that Earl was able to wrestle the gun away from her. Earl also said that she repeatedly hit him while he tried to take the tool away. Earl's mistress at the scene apparently says that Mrs. Earl Thomas threatened her and the other women because, of course, pointing the gun at them and yelling, I got something for all you. I feel like there's a, yeah, that's right. That was removed from this quote in the name of brevity as in, yeah, that's right. I got something for all you. That's my guess on how that went. Right? Like, like I understand they got space constraints, but yeah, that's right. Or some form of that's right. Or you hear me some form of that proceeded. I got something for all you from, my understanding of language, it's probably the way that it went. And yes, Nita's, one of Nita's other friends, uh, had the knife. And then the cops arrested Earl Thomas's, uh, wife. Earl himself, uh, was not arrested. They put an emergency protective order on Mrs. Earl Thomas. This all happened. Okay. I imagine that all of you who are listening to this probably had heard the story already, but y'all enjoy hearing me tell stories. And I think it's better when it's put, you know, I'll be putting flavor on it. Right. So anyway, a couple things that dawned on me about this story when it hit and our reactions. Number one, of course, was many of us at least thought at first that this was a story of domestic violence before we find out what the story was the story of domestic violence and we were bracing ourselves for the worst and you know how we were going to handle this another incident of domestic violence how did this dude just shrug off some notion of domestic violence you know all this stuff or whatever and you know what the story turned out to be an incident of domestic violence <laughs> Like, it actually happened, okay? I understand what the circumstances are, right? But this is, the, if I tell you about a dude running up on his woman because she is cheating on him and he busts through the door and pulls a gun, we gonna say, yo, that is an incident of domestic violence. So we actually do, in fact, in this case, 
have an incident of domestic violence. However, we also have jokes. We have lots and lots of jokes. The jokes are spanning from all over the place. I'm asking this like really kind of sort of as a philosophical question, right? Because I got the jokes. I've got my laughs off. You've gotten your laughs off. All kinds of people have gotten their laughs off. Okay. Should we be getting our laughs off on this given what the circumstance was? Cause I gotta say, Earl was tripping. However, there is nothing funny about having a gun pulled on you. Nothing, nothing, nothing at all. And it's also interesting, given that many of us thought that when this started off that it was going to be about domestic violence where Earl assaulting her, with all of that going on, it sounds like he only played defense. He only was on self-defense in the whole play, right? But we are not yet at a point in our journey, as enlightened people or whatever it is, that you hear a story like this and be like mortified by it, or, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. We we still have a ways to go before the initial reaction to this is like jokes. Because this is kind of like the same as the Tiger Woods thing, right? In a very, very similar sort of situation. And all that was was jokes. He allegedly got run up out his crib with a golf club. Right? This is where we stand with Earl. I wonder this. This happened in Austin, by the way. You can put together some details about the scene and the crowd all you want. You think there's any chance that when Mrs. Earl Thomas bust through that door, the first thing she said was, hello, is it me you looking for? And again, I'm telling you, I'm just talking about the way that we process these stories when the roles kind of get reversed, right? We're not at a point where we don't treat it as jokes, right or wrong. I'm going to let you make your judgment on whether we should. I'm just making a factual observation. So Lionel Richie had been married to a woman named Brenda for a very long time. Then apparently the marriage started going bad and Lionel Richie had started dating one of his backup singers. I know there's going to be some people out here who don't think that this part of the story matters, but it is worth noting that Brenda Richie uh, is an African-American and the mistress backup singer was a Caucasian, right? Just letting you fill out all the details. So apparently Lionel was laid up with uh that backup singing Huzzy. And Brenda apparently had finally had enough. And I don't know exactly how it went. But apparently she bust up in the crib. And put them paws on Lionel. Right? Like like this is a legendary. Like this is what happened to Lionel Richie. He's even in his behind the music. That Brenda ran up on him. Uh, When that happened. I went to college with this dude. Who told me that Lionel Richie. Was his dad's favorite singer. Right? Jamaican dude. You can see it, right? Loved him, Solana Richie. He said after Lana Richie's woman ran up on him at the crib, he never heard another note of Lana Richie's music in their house ever again. He was done with Lana Richie because Lana Richie got run upon by his woman. He disconnected himself from Lana Richie completely because Lana Richie was the victim in this situation. That's like 30 years ago when that happened. 30 years later, we are still here at this point where we're like, yo, you hear Earl's woman ran up on him with the two? Like, this whole thing is a Bobby Womack song. Like, every single bit of this feels like a Bobby Womack song. And it's lucky that he wound up getting out of it. Because, again, she didn't just call any friend. She called a friend who show up with a knife. And so they said that Earl's woman is in there with the gun. One of the other women is swinging the knife. Now imagine just being one of these ladies who thought they were just going to have a delightful romp with the future Hall of Famer and his brother, right? This is not what they thought they signed up for. Not at all, right? And the cops, let me make sure I read this part. I think this is very important. When they rolled up at 3.41 a.m. because they got a call about a disturbance, and the cops said, we observed that a black female wearing an orange sweater with a knife in her hand, later identified as Nina Thomas, was chasing a shirtless black male, later identified as Earl Thomas, with a pistol in his hand around the vehicle. This is after he has secured the pistol. She's still coming at him because she thinks there's no bullet in that gun. She's like, what that gun going to do for you? So she's running at him with this knife, and there are other people who are around and yo, I tell you this, 
whoever owns that Airbnb, they about to get a letter from the uh the neighborhood association. Your Airbnb days are done. Y'all can't be out here making all this noise. You can't just be having people coming up in the neighborhood doing this. That's next level tracking too, to be able to triangulate the location, find it, coordinate with your girls. Yes. <laughs> We're all going to this location, this Airbnb. Yes. Put this in your Google Maps. Yes. I'll see you over there. I mean, to your point earlier, like, this story is kind of made for you, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is like the definition of stay ready all-star. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. Here's how ready they stay, Gabe. Here's how ready they stay. This is all happening at 3 o'clock in the morning, right? Presumably, these other ladies were asleep. And then they, and, and, and then they got the call. No, oh, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. Are they like, like soldiers, like in the military where they always got the bag packed at the door just in case we got to go to war? Right? There wasn't no stumbling. Or did she like keep the knife in the car? Is the knife always there? Who exactly are these people? If she's hanging out with these people on a regular basis, Earl, y'all make too much money to still be kicking it in these circles. Like, and Earl, you had to know she was capable of this, right? Like, I feel like you've known her for quite a while. You had to know when you made that rollout. I tell you, here's what I think is, here's what I think, given that this is Texas, right? That's the last time early that house without the gun. No sir, Bob. Hey, he looking at it now like, you know what? That's actually what my whole mistake was. If he had took the gun with him, all this could have been diffused much more quickly. Instead, he was on the business end of it. He's staring down the barrel. He ain't looking at the hammer. You know, like, yo, damn. So I'm not sure, like, what, like, how we're going to treat it as the days go, right? I don't think I'm gonna get in trouble for what I'm doing here on this segment. I'm just gonna be the first one to say it that, yeah, we're not at the place in our journey where an Earl Thomas story comes about, and we're not like this, and we're not going to have some chuckles about it at first. Maybe somebody will think, piece it up, and bring it to the right place. Cause, man, this is, I mean, this is wildly, their whole situation seems wildly unhealthy, right? He's running out of the house because she says that he has a drinking problem. She finds out he's cheating, rolls up with the tool, all of this going on all at once. Like this, they got some stuff they need to work out. Like there's some things underneath this that are not funny at all but when you put them all together in that story hey man i'm not the one who made it funny i'm just telling you what the story is all right it is the right time book club uh this year we are reading the jordan rules by sam smith we have had j.a adande on to join us we've had vinnie goodwill of yahoo sports to join us and now this week Two-time champion with the Detroit Pistons as a player, one-time champion as an executive. His name is Joe Dumars. Joe, how's it going, man? Good, man. How are you, Bo? Dude, I'm doing all right. And we wanted to have you on in part because Michael Jordan, in the rare time that he felt like complimenting somebody else, when asked who did the best job of defending him one-on-one, of course he said nobody defended him one-on-one, but he said that Joe Dumars was at the top of that list of people defending him one-on-one. And one thing I wondered is, for you, what worked? Because, I mean, you're 6'3", he was 6'6". It would seem that you would be a guy that would have trouble with his length, but you did do a better job of it than most people did. You know, I always looked at it with him, um, Bo, is that it didn't matter really if you were 6'6 six, six or 6'3". Six, when he elevates, uh, there's nobody else that's going to elevate with him. So I tried to do all of my work early on the floor before he elevated. Just make it as tough as possible. Make it uh, uncomfortable for him to uh, get into a rhythm or to get where he wanted to get. Once he elevated, you know, whether he's six six or six three, it didn't matter. My man was he was going to do his thing. Well, what's the difference between the way you could play defense then for the younger folks who don't quite get it? Like, what was the difference between playing defense in that era versus now? Just a lot more body, body to body contact. I mean, like you could ride guys off of screens uh, if they were on a high pick and roll and had the ball in their hand and they're going to come off the screen, you actually, you were taught as soon as the screen, you see the screen come and step into your man's body, jam him up and ride him over the screen. Now that's, you know, that's automatic foul probably right now. So just, just a lot more uh, body to body contact, bro. And the counterpoint is now they can basically zone up. Like when you were guarding the dude, it was you and him. Yeah. A lot of times you felt like you were out on an Island, you know, you could take a peek around and see if you had any help or where it might be coming from. But basically, you were out there on your own and you had to square up and just try to guard a guy one on one. And I always felt like you kind of existed in an interesting space in the idea of the bad boy Pistons because you were the one guy that people did not think of in that same way. Like the things people might say about Isaiah or Lambeer or Mahorn, those never came around to you. 
Well, I never thought that the bad boy part and the extracurricular, it, for me, it was kind of funny. I, I would look at the guys get into it. What I thought we really brought was toughness, was physical toughness on the court. And I never thought you had to be loud. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Louisiana guy. So, we you know, we kind of walk softly, carry big sticks. And so I never thought you had to be a talker, loud, demonstrative to be tough. And so I just felt like I was, you know, the guy – part of the bad boys, but the one that didn't have to do a whole lot of talking. Hey, do you think that a lot of that, you know, the imagery around the bad boys is kind of obscured the fact that you guys could also put up points, right? Like this wasn't like the Knicks in the 90s. Right. I've had a conversation with my son and, and he's gone back and looked at what we were averaging per year. And he's like, Dad, you guys like average 108, 109 points. I said, yeah, we were we were really pushing it, scoring uh, and then coming back and guarding people. So, yeah, it, it gets obscured. So one thing I wonder about with the Pistons and the Bulls, and you guys played them, I want to say, three years, you know, 88, 89, and 90 in the postseason. At what point did, for you guys, it feel like the Bulls were a legitimate threat to where you were? When we got to Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals in 90, and we, we, we won, but we knew they were coming back. We knew they'd be back the next year and that they weren't going away. Like that game in particular, because that's the Scottie Pippen migraine game. And I think for a lot of people, when they see it in the Jordan rules, it's interesting the way they did it is kind of through the context of Scottie. Just imagine what it must be like if you're seeing double and it's as loud and hot as it was in there. Like how intense was that scene just to start the game? It was uh, it was intense, Bo. It was for people who were old enough to be able to watch and experience the NBA at that time. You know, not only was it rivalries. But it was intense rivalries. It wasn't manufactured. It wasn't this normal, just just walk out, shake hands, and play. I mean, it was intense. And guys, you know, the guys got into their feelings uh, on, on this stuff, man. And so by the time those games would come around, and as a team, when you get ready to run out on the court, and you're in the locker room, and you start lining up, and you're going to run out on the court, the tension was so high, man. The tension was so tight until you felt it when you ran out there. It was palpable. You could feel it. Now, everybody knows what you guys did that the Bulls didn't like, but what was it about them that burned you guys up? I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if, if they were doing anything to annoy us. Here's what I will say, Bo, is this, is that it's not like we were playing a different style against the other 28 teams and then just one style versus them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, that, the only thing I'll say is, like, we weren't just playing like that against the Bulls. You know, that was that was 82 nights a year. That's what we were bringing. And so it, it wasn't just them. Like, was there a point, though, where you guys realized where you guys have been playing this way, and now all of a sudden, like, this is the thing that's on you. Like, it's not just the way that you play, but it becomes almost a brand. At a certain point, it did. But we had been playing physical. You know, it, it, what happened was, I guess the tag followed the play, meaning we had been playing that way 86, 87, 88, and then around, I think, 88, 89, that's when the, the, the moniker of the bad boys came about. But we had been playing that way for like two, three, four years uh, but before that even came about. So it never really changed who we were and how we played. The only thing that changed was that there was a name put to it. Right. And so for the 91 season, which was an interesting one for you guys, because Isaiah had the wrist injury, and so he's not at the form that he had been prior to that. Uh, Brendan Malone said in the Jordan Rules, he was a scout for the Pistons at the time, and he said the thing that he noticed about the Bulls in 91 that was different was that their intensity had changed, that the defensive intensity had improved. Was that something that you had noticed about them coming, like as that season went on, as they were starting to ascend? Yeah, and the interesting thing about it is that, you know, we saw a lot of ourselves in them during that time. We had gone through that transition with the Celtics, and we had to grow up and get tougher, not only physically, but mentally tougher to withstand. If you go into the garden and they go on a 12-0 run, you can't fold tent and that's game. You have to learn how to call timeout, gather yourself, come back, and punch back. We went through that. We transformed ourselves into a team that could do that. You saw that with them, 88, 89, 90. By the time 91 came around, those guys had grown up, man, and they had gotten tougher and stronger and and mentally, they didn't fold when things didn't go their way. So you saw it. You, you, you're you looking at it and you're going, they're growing up. These are not kids anymore. Like, did you feel like before that you guys knew that they would fold? Or like, because I was wondering at times, like when you had that advantage, like me playing something with my older brother, my brother knows, all right, I can get him right here. <laughs> yeah, I, I think when you're that team that the other one is trying to knock off, you notice everything about them. You notice when you can put them away, you notice that we're physically tougher, we're mentally tougher. You see all that. When it starts turning, you see that too. It's not like you just see 
yeah, we got our thumbs on, on these guys. You can see that, all right, they're pushing back, and they're pushing back in a different way now. Now, did Jordan himself make a turn, or was it more so the guys around him? Probably more so the guys around him who started really pushing back. Mike was competing at a crazy level all those years. Like, so it, it wasn't like he um, all of a sudden got better. He, he, was, he, was, he was doing his thing no matter what. I think it's the other guys that really grew into their roles and became much, much tougher mentally and physically. Yeah, because I think it seems like, and even in reading this book and the different things that we've seen about this, that Scotty was more of a linchpin in that way than Mike was. Like, there was a level of overcome that had to come from him that seemed to be, like, bigger than it was for anybody else. I don't know if it was just him. They they would know internally whether that was the case or not. I'm just saying that Mike was the guy that was, you know, hardcore all those years, Bo. And then you saw all the rest of them, Horace Grant, you saw BJ, you saw all those guys step up, so... I wouldn't say it's just Scotty because all of them had to really step up to beat us. It wasn't going to be just Scotty stepping up and, okay, they're going to win. Like, all those guys started hitting big shots and just got a whole lot more mentally tougher than what they were. Now, going into those 91 Eastern Conference Finals for you guys, like, how confident were you going in to face the Bulls? I think we had gone to the finals three straight years. You're not getting to the Eastern Conference Finals that fourth year and thinking, ah, we don't have a chance. You've been to the finals three straight years. So no matter what, you think that you can win. We also knew that we were beat up and tired. But in our minds, we thought, you know what? We're beat up, we're tired, but we can get this done. We can grind through this and get this done. And so you you never stop thinking that can't do it. I, I remember specifically after game three, they're up 3-0, and I'm thinking, damn, okay, we're going to have to do this four straight games. In my mind, I'm still thinking we can come back and get this done. So you never stop thinking until it's over that, uh, especially if you've been to the finals three straight years, you never stop thinking that you can get it done. Do people underestimate the mileage those deep playoff runs make? Because whenever I hear the presumption about the Bulls who just win eight straight titles, I'm like, dude, Jordan looked like he was spent by the end of that third one. You are, man. You start playing into June, you know, five, six straight years. I mean (laughs) – I guess people think that, you know, oh, man, it's exciting. And, you know, you're in the finals or you're in the conference finals year after year after year. And, and, and of course, you got energy. But, man, it, it, it takes a toll, man. By the time you do that three, four, five years in a row, I'm telling you, man, your body is basically running on fumes at that point. Now, did you think that it would be almost 30 years later and people would still be litigating how you left the court in 91? <laughs> Oh my God, man. The real, the, the, listen to the relitigation of this has been funny and fun and a trip for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never thought it was that deep. You know, what I mean? like it was, it was what it was. It's amusing to me that it's still being spoken about, but it's fun too. I, because I don't really, I, so Paul, I never like when all the stuff was happening on the court when I was playing, I never got into my feelings and dove into that. Well, I'm damn sure not going to do it now at at, at this point in my life. You know what I mean? Like, so I look at it the same way now that I looked at it when I was playing. When the craziness would start happening, most of the time I would just step back and just check it out and like, wow. Yeah, they really, dudes are really doing their thing right now. Guys could be scrapping. uh, And I'd just watch for a while and then it was over with. All right, let's get back to hooping. (laughs) Yeah, this one reads to me so much is basically, it. this is one of those because it involves Isaiah things, right? Like if you're looking for something to get mad at Isaiah about, this is going to be the thing that is going to be. Because I'm like, I can't believe that regular people care this much. Like I could believe that Jordan might care. I could believe that Bill and Beer might care. It's amazing to me that like fans still hold that moment like it's such an important one. Yeah, I guess it's because I, you know it's hard for me. You know that's an interesting thing you say that about. I almost would <laughs> to like to ask you. Yeah, I mean, you know, you you're a sports journalist for years. Like what? I, I don't understand. Like what's the draw of it? Other than you know, man, you know Zeke is you know Zeke's my dude, and so it's Zeke and and primarily Mike, I guess, talking. But I, I don't really know why it's touched such a nerve. I I really don't. Yeah, like, I remember when it happened, right? I was 10 years old when it happened, and my dad was furious because he was he was all about Mike, right? And he was just furious. He's like, oh, man, they beat him. Now they don't even want to stand out here and everything else. But he was that was like a day, right? Like, that was all that it took. And then, like, as it comes back up, and then as the Dream Team stuff comes back up, and I, like, I hear it go around, and I'm like, wow, there's a real passion that surrounds this discussion. And my thought has always been that with Isaiah, it all goes back to game seven and 87 and what happened in the locker room afterward uh, with the Larry Bird quote. And then from there, like Isaiah never made all league after that, like all of these things then shook out. And so now I just look at it. Like if I'm doing that documentary in 
on one hand, I'm like, I wouldn't have put that part in about them walking off the floor, except for the fact that people, Michael Jordan included, still care so much about it. And it's just hard for me to grasp. Bo, I, I, I've been watching uh, the documentary, like everyone else, from Sunday evenings out here. And, um, you know, BJ and I, BJ Armstrong and I are really close. And so BJ and I, we, we, we have breakfast out here every, every Friday morning. We, he and I have breakfast every Friday morning and over the years. And we laugh, talk about everything. So on Sunday nights, he and I have been getting on the phone I, and I've been on the phone with him going, Oh man, y'all have some real drama going on over there. Like, so for me, it's, it's entertaining. It's fun. It's funny. I get to talk to a friend who was there in their locker room about all this, but the seriousness of it, how, the feelings are still there. B and I are both just like, damn. <laughs> I, I guess I guess this is real, huh? So like, it's not even like um, it's fun and amusing to me. That I, I guess that's the best way I can put it, Bo. Is that it's funny, amusing. B and I laugh and talk about every Sunday night. We get on the phone and go, okay, all right, well, oh, oh, that's what's going on over there. So that's how we look at it, you know. And, and so you know, when I see the fans and everybody else, I'm going, wow. And people are really serious about this. Yeah, we're going to talk to BJ uh, next week with this. And the one interesting thing I'm looking forward to talk to him about that I somehow didn't realize until I started researching this is that BJ was from Detroit, right? Like like him, him being from Detroit, Isaiah being from Chicago, there's so much interesting stuff going on that like crosses between the teams. So I, after that 91 series, I've always been curious about the Pistons. Like after that series, how did you guys view yourselves at that point? We were kind of the wounded champions at that point former champions at that point. And we were a team that if we didn't infuse some energy and some youth, that it was going to be tough. And if you think about it, I think, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly a year, Bo, but I want to say like 93, maybe Lambeer retires and maybe Isaiah, 93 or 94. I'm not sure. Within a couple of years, like a couple of those guys, they were done. You know, they, they had retired. And then uh, Rodman was gone. So the team at that point, we went on a five or six year incredible run. But then at that point, guys retired and then guys were traded or whatever. And so the run was over. So by the time 91 came, but within two years, I, I mean, it, it, the team was a shell of itself at that point. And we were at the end of our run. At, you know, Quite simply, we were at the end of the run. We maxed it out as far as we possibly could. And then at that point, it was over and guys retired. Guys were older and retired. Like, how much do you care about, like, the historical legacy of the team? And, like, how much respect you guys run has received from basketball fans? Not a whole lot. Like, what does that mean? Like, when I hear that, like, okay, the respect, I don't even know. Like, I think that people in the industry, they know how hard it is to do what we did. It's not easy. If it was, you'd have a whole lot more teams that have done it, bro. But it's hard to do what we did. It's hard to go to the finals three straight years. It's hard to win that thing back to back. We maxed out, man. We actually did everything we set out to accomplish to do. Either you understand how tough that is and appreciate it, or you don't. And so if you don't, then it's like, okay, I, I get it. You don't understand that. And so upset, uh, dis- like, no, not at all. I just look at it like, ah, they have no idea. They have no idea how hard that is. But what did you think? And this is, the, you know, the, the infamous Jordan quote before game four. People are happy the game is going back to going to get back to a clean game and away from the bad boy image. People don't want this kind of basketball. The dirty play, the flagrant foul, the unsportsmanlike conduct is bad for basketball. How did you receive that upon hearing it? Didn't care at all. And I'm going to tell you why. Bo, you know how physical we were playing out there? Like, it was some real physical play back in the day, right? Real physical play. These, This was, as we would say, and as, and as you know, Bo, being a Houston guy, this was grown man business out there. This was grown man business. I'm not about to get all of my feelings because one of the guys over there said something. Because Mike said something. I'm not, I'm not tripping on that. Like, this is physical grown man business. So now all of a sudden I'm supposed to get in my feelings because he said something like, I, I, oh, OK, cool. That, that that That's cool. Like, you guys are up 3-0. He said that. OK, cool. But I look at all the years leading up to that quote. Man, it was some grown man business going out on that court. And so now, now you can't get a guy like me. I'm a Louisiana guy, man. I'm cut from something different. I'm not getting in my feelings about that. Like, are you kidding? Come on, man. Like, like I said to somebody the other day, <laughs> we were the bad guys in the movie. You got an air of, we do what we was doing. <laughs> 
just roll the credits. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just roll the credits. The movie's over. Roll the credits. Okay. We were the tough guys. We were the physical guys. Mike and those guys, you know, they wore the white hat. Mike was, you know, incredible. I've said time and time again, best I've seen. But in terms of him being, you know, emotional and saying something like that, uh, 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 okay, cool. Yeah, you guys, I, I find that the Bad Boys Pistons are, like, such an interesting group of people. Like, I watched the documentary that they did, whatever I see, like, to get together. Y'all seem like the closest thing to a bunch of dudes hanging out that I feel like I've ever seen from an NBA basketball team. Yeah, I mean, like, that, that's what I keep saying. Like, it, 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 we knew what it was, man. Like, we knew what it was, and we knew that, look, man, we want to be the best in the world. We want to be world champions. We want to hold those trophies up. We want to wear those rings. We want to raise banners. We want to be great. I'm telling you, Bo, we committed to that. We laid out and said, I'm in. I'm in, and I'm completely committed to that. Okay, so now, you know, we're the guys who wore the black hats, I'm not coming back and saying now, like, well, you know, let me explain. Like, no, that's we were the tough physical guys that could hoop. And because you can't just be tough and physical and be world champions, you got to know how to hoop. We had smart guys, very high IQ guys, both. I mean, like really super IQ. Like, like take a guy like Dennis Rodman. Man, his IQ on the court, Bo, was off the charts, man. Just off the charts. So we we signed up for this. So that's why when you see us, it's like, yeah, we know what we signed up for. Now, I do wonder this. Was there any point at which you noticed the way the officials started handling it differently when you were guarding Jordan? They started calling things much tighter, Bo. Uh, by the time 91 rolled around, yeah, they started calling things a little bit tighter. And you go, oh, that's a foul? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know that was a foul now. So, yeah, yeah, things got, you know, they started calling it much tighter by the time 91 rolled around. Yeah, Scotty talks about Jersey him and Mike as a defender. It's like the referees are asking, you know, asking Mike to take pictures. <laughs> that was his line. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it may have happened. I don't know. <laughs> You went on to become an executive. And I think one of the interesting things in the documentary is hearing the way that Jordan talks about Jerry Krause, which I find curious because I'd be curious to know, like, it being a general manager is harder than Mike thought it was, right? Like, he's been, you know, been a guy to run a team. And when he was a player, he had all these ideas. And now that he's doing it, it's a little harder. For you, what was the transition like into being an executive and building a team? The number one thing for me is from the 12th guy to the first guy. Finding each one of those guys, bro, that's going to buy in to his role. And you may have to pass on a more talented guy to get that. And so for me, I knew, okay, if you're going to win, I've seen this before. I live this. I, I know that every guy has to buy in. And if you can find those guys, you got a chance. And so for me, that's, that, that's the whole way I looked at it is just finding specific guys that's going to buy in and be all in. And like I say, because you can have a talented, Really super talented guy, but he has something else on his mind. He has, I got to be an all-star. I got to, I got to get mine. I got to get whatever, right? For me, I just looked at it and, and knew that from my own personal experience that if I can get 12 guys to buy in, we're going to have a chance to raise this banner man. Well, you built one of the few teams that did not have like a true superstar, but then went on to win a championship. Was there at any point with that 2014 that you were concerned about not having that guy? No, because by the time we got to be true contenders, I saw that we could beat most teams in the league. And I saw that our depth made up for that. And for me, once I realized that we weren't going to have that one transcendent star bow, I knew then, okay, get deeper. And deep. Let's say I was six deep at that point. I realized I got to get nine deep. Because if I'm not going to have a superstar, I have to have nine to ten guys that's going to bring this every night to offset that one or two guys on, on the other side of it. And so for me, once I realized we weren't going to like be superstar built, it was be as deep as possible. Do you want to get back into it? I like my role now with Sacramento. Like, I, I really do. It's, it's a perfect role for me right now. If something came beyond that, maybe. I don't know. But I know what I'm doing right now, it allows me to do what I do best. And, and, and that's to, to help build. And so, like, like I never, like, bro, I never saw myself as a coach. 
Like I never saw myself on the sideline, up and down. Uh, like I can help build and I can create a vision and how we're going to execute this. So I know who I am in this business. I, I know what I do in this business. And it's not coach or do anything like that, but it's to help build and have a vision. Okay. How we're going to put this together. And so for me, to be in a role right now, to be a, 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 an executive advisor for a team right now, for me, it's perfect. Well, what do you think is the biggest difference between trying to build a team now versus when you were playing? I would say that it's the amount of movement that you can almost now just look at any team and figure out how can I go get that guy. I don't think back then, because I was a player back then, I didn't see as much movement then. And but so, but I wasn't really thinking as a GM then. You know, I was thinking as a player. But I do know now that 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 the amount of movement that takes place in the NBA right now allows you the opportunity to really build teams now. Where before, once you put your team together, it was not really easy to just go and pluck guys from all over the league to try to build your team together. So now I think that's much different. All right. That is Joe Dumars, my man. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate you joining us. You out there in sunny Southern California, living a good life. <laughs> yeah, it's all good, man. Yeah, I asked you this, like, if I took you back 35, 40 years and told you, Joe, you'd be living a good life out here, hanging out in LA, taking calls, you know, advising the basketball team. What would you have told me? I would say, nah, boy, that's, I'm probably going to end up living in Houston, eating that Papa Do's. <laughs> Yo, that's I'd say that's going to the big city, baby. Like, like that, that's the thing. That's the move. But when you're in Louisiana, that's the big city you know. You're just like, oh, I'm going to Houston, man. You know, so. <laughs> oh, I know. That's how y'all be acting. Like, as soon as y'all show up to town, they're like, y'all, y'all, like, y'all just got to Paris. <laughs> But hey, man, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this thing a couple times a week. My man Gabe Bassain handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. And remember, subscribe to The Right Time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. We'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app. Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones.